Welcome to the evening sessions at No, and we have our first speaker, that is Willow Brew here. She is talking about weaponized social. Willow Brew is currently working with uh, Valpine Blue, where she coordinates, she helps coordinate distributed teams, and uh, she's previously worked with humanitarian and digital response, and ha has a lot. Um, vast uh, experience in those fields. Uh, what you'll be talking about today is something very interesting. Uh, we've always talked about protocols for code. We've always talked about uh, what are the ethics for code, but have we talked about interactions? No. Now she's going to talk about weapon weaponized social, a way for social interactions to be protocolized. Yeah. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Oh, a big round of applause before she begins. And I'm especially excited because Meredith is here and she's the other, uh, actually uh, probably lifted even more on this project than I did. So I'm, I'm excited that you're here. Um, here, so stick figures. Um, I posted the link to the Prezi, which is what we'll be using here on my Twitter. So if you want to follow along later, you can. Um, I, I like stick figures. So I'm interested in this question of what is equality? Like, what does equality look like? Um, and as we do more and more things on the internet, we can look at more and more of our interactions. Um, and we've always had access to some data, but there are questions of, is equality in our access to resources? is equality in the incidence of violence uh, or lack thereof towards people. See, there's a little bruise on this one now. Is it in the way that we speak to each other? Um, and it's in all of these things, but how do we know if we're, if we're getting there? So right now we know we have a lot of inequality in the world and it's in things like where the, the gap in, in gender wages comes from. Um, and I just read a fascinating book. If you, if you or anyone you know is of the mindset of like women do different sorts of work um, and it's not worth the same amount or whatever else, the history of marriage um, talks about how people used to get married as a business transaction um, and you could love a lot of different people but love inside the marriage was actually not a super good thing to do. Uh, and then in those business transactions, the women did certain kinds of work most of the time. Um, but as we shifted into capitalism, the roles of the man going outside of the house were the ones that got more and more paid. And so the work of the women was less and less valued in this new system of economy. So it's really interesting, but if you want to know about the history of inequality, we should read more history. There's also inequality in where violence happens. So this might be on an individual level or it might be at a more systemic level. Um, these are, and like, I, I'm bringing these up because there are patterns in inequality, which is what we need to start looking at in order to address them, right? We need to know where to focus our energies in order to uh, have the positive impacts on the world that we would like. Um, so this is uh, intimate partner violence. It's one person against another. Um, but we also have systemic violence. Like this is the, um, I don't like this graph for a number of reasons. One is that they have named Latino as a race, that's a, or a Hispanic as a race, and that's your ability to speak Spanish. You're of a Spanish-speaking people, but that's fine. Um, but we have this over-representation of non-whites in the prison system, right? And like liberals built the prison system as it is now, and now it is systemically affecting some people more than others. And we need to address that, right? Like we need to think about the patterns that we're a part of. So how do we uh, measure and increase and maintain equality? Uh, Lessig talks about four fulcrums for social change, you know, markets, laws, social norms, and architecture. We like to talk a lot about markets, like if it's good for us, they'll buy it, right? Or the, uh, that one of the 
difficulties of open source software and, and Libre is, is dealing with markets and how we fit in, also how we pay ourselves as activists. Um, laws are not something I'm really going to get into here. I'm, I'm a terrible anarchist because I like law <laughs> as the externalization of values of society that like we expect people to adhere to certain ways of interacting. It's the enforcement part I'm not super keen on. Um, but the thing that I want to get into here are the social norms and architecture. And while we can measure markets pretty easily because we know what people are buying and where money is going, we can track that more and more, and laws we're able to externalize and document, um, architecture and its effects on us and social norms are really difficult to measure. Like, how would you do that? Let's see. So while we have ways of measuring uh, violence in some ways, not always, and we have ways of measuring income disparity as, as two examples, we don't have a way of really figuring out how social interactions are going. Um, so there are these things called social scripts, uh, which is, dates back in sociology to the study of human sexuality and the way that we know how to woo someone of our preferred gender, um, if we're into wooing people, is we've been surrounded by media and our parents and our friends, and we know that, at least in the US, you, like, you first you might, you might flirt a little bit, and you try to get a phone number, and you go out for coffee, and then you hold hands, and then you might kiss. And, and like, there's this progression that we know about, right? But it's not the same in every culture. And the what is considered the most intimate changes. Um, and so that's a script that we're following. So weaponized social, um, I'll get to that in just a second. Meredith put incredibly well, so I'm just gonna read this to you because that's terrible, is the existing harms of social scripts we ran while in smaller geographically constrained groups are being amplified due to network effects. Tiny unchecked errors scaled become large harms as people find ways to exploit them in life just as in software. Does this make sense? Ish. Tiny nods? Okay. Um, so we have a wiki, of course, because wikis. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a heart for Meredith because she's great. Um, okay, so we don't even have ways of understanding social interactions at the scale that we have now. Like, we're running into all of these ethical issues around Facebook and other things because social scientists have never had data sets this big, right? Our sample sizes have always been so small that we struggle with statistical significance. Um, and so our field has not progressed that much. So we don't have a lot of research or frameworks to work from in how to deal with things like DDoSing and doxing and, and other things and the social dynamics of that. So here's a proposed framework. I pulled it from uh, disaster and humanitarian response work, which is what I do most of the time. And there's a four-part cycle, which is preparedness. Like, I live in San Francisco, so I have a go bag um, that waits by the door, so when there's the next earthquake, I have a decent pair of shoes and some extra clothes and some snacks and things like that, right? Like, I am prepared, I have water. Response is what's gonna happen after the earthquake when I'm digging my friends out of the rubble or being pulled out myself. Recovery is after all of the aftershocks have passed, then um, we start rebuilding, right? And then mitigation is retrofitting buildings such that they don't collapse in the same way during an earthquake. It's changing the actual infrastructure so that uh, the damage that is called, caused is different. So this is the framework that we've applied to this. I'll explain some more. So first, we have this thing where the extreme event in online space is not an earthquake. It's not the planet coming after us. Um, or us building in terrible places that we shouldn't live, but are lovely like San Francisco. Hello, tiny spider. Um, so on the wiki, we've broken down into these different components of what, what does the extreme event even look like? Then we get into preparedness, and this is what a lot of InfoSec is based around, is uh, how do you lock down your accounts, et cetera. So this was our first event in New York. It's, it's Meredith and TQ on the laptop. Super fun. Um, and so this is in how do you prepare against it? So how do you 
try to make safe space if that's a thing you want to do? How do you support people who are being activists? Um, do we even want to use codes of conduct? Like questions like that and if they're doing the, the work that we think that they should be doing. Um, and also uh, personal reflection of how to critique me. Then we get into response. So the second event hosted was in Nairobi. Um, and we started thinking about how do people respond to, to online attacks um, or to large scale social incidents online. So self-aware checklists, like something bad is happening. I'm gonna pause and think about if I'm actually uh, making this worse or better, etc. Then we get into recovery, right? So like what happens after um, social aspects have been weaponized? There's nothing here. Like we did a fair amount of research in a lot of different spaces and countries, et cetera. And like, if your online reputation gets sacked for something, you, you, there's no coming back from it. Like you change your name, right? Um, and this is really concerning. Right? If something goes poorly, we're not taking care of our people um, af after the fact. We should fix that. And then we have mitigation. Um, we also had a session in San Francisco that focused on mitigation. We hadn't planned that it was gonna follow this cycle, it just kinda happened that way, which I find really fascinating. Um, but we didn't take any pictures in San Francisco because we were so excited to build things. Um, and I'm really proud of this work because it starts getting into how do we change the ways that we interact online such that these social harms are reduced um, but are not quashing anyone's ability or desire to speak. Does that make sense? Because it's not, it's not a choice between what you can say and who you can say it to. Like you, you should be able to say what you want to say. Freedom of expression does not have to be at odds with people's sense of safety and ability to participate. Um, so. so we're talking about shifting social norms through architecture. Dun, dun. Oh, I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite uh, Slack channels that I'm a part of, um, which this is the, the graph of users added. So uh, female identified people are on the bottom, male identified people are on the top. Um, and so we've, like, we've pushed to have gender equity, and we've done a little bit better over time. So this is um, another version of that graph. Um, but even though it's still slightly over overrepresented for men, um, they do most of the talking, right? And so we notice this pattern. We're like, what can we change about the the expectations of communication um, in order to to get these a little bit better? And we have. Uh, we're working on a couple of different options, but I want to tell you a story about how. Uh, no, I'm going to get there in a second. So here are things that we could be measuring in order to see if equality is, is happening in our communities. Like, what does that mean? And are these the numbers that we want to be tracking? Um, so we have the number of connections that someone can have, the threading model that you end up in, how different aspects of a thread are prioritized. Oh, no, it disappeared. Privacy control. Um, so like, who can see what it is you're saying? Scope control. There are a lot of different uh, aspects of this. And TQ, I think this was, was your part of the project that was amazing. Um, and so we started like, outlining what are all of these different uh, aspects of, of communication. And do we want to tweak these? Like, do we want to take a scientific approach to reaching equality where if we don't have representation happening the way we want it to, can we change our infrastructure in an explicit way and see if it actually impacts the way people are participating or not? Does that make sense? Like, let's, let's science this shit. I'm, yeah. So, I'm gonna tell you a story, though, about something that isn't measurable right now. Um, my favorite channel in that Slack group that I told you about is called Awkward Silence. And someone created it in October of like, last year and invited a bunch of people and no one said anything in it for like four months. 
And it was, it was my favorite. And then one day, I was like, oh, do you know what's going to be so good? And I posted the elephant emoji in it. And someone else immediately deleted it and changed it to the, the subject of the channel. Right? And like, that's, that's how I like to participate in those spaces. It's not in typing messages, which is the thing that Slack tracks right now. Like you can track who says how much stuff. But that's, like, I really like emojis, and I really like moving text around and posting pictures and things like that. And so um, what we choose to measure is what we get, is one of the, the systems theory things. So what are we choosing to, to measure in trying to reach more equality. Does that make sense? But making explicit choices in the things that you build um, so that people can play. So I was talking to Jonathan Stray about this talk, um, and he brought up this excellent point that idealists design systems and pragmatists find paths. Um, and I really like designing systems, but I'm also a person who, who posts the elephant emoji, right? And so, um, even the systems that we design and that we're so pleased with and excited about to share, if they're not having the desired impact, we need to reassess, like find your path as other people also find their paths through your system. So this is me. I really didn't talk for very long. We should have a conversation. Do people have questions? I hope you have questions. All right. So uh, this is me on Twitter. This is me on Mastodon. I hope it works. It's only going to work if we all use it. Um, <laughs> and uh, major hearts again. And there are other people doing excellent work in this space. Sorry, I'll get there in just a second. Um, so these are all wonderful. And again, I'll, uh, this has already been posted to the internet. Um, and if you want any help in designing and finding paths for this sort of thing, I am uh, working with, with various groups on how to do that. Question, yeah. Does it work? Yeah, it, it, it works. Uh, thanks, first off, for uh, sharing your insights. Um, I, I was wondering if what you and we are looking for, if, if there is a, a, a universal way to solve this or if there should be well multiple answers, I'm not even sure if answers is the right the right word, but to address this, is there is there one silver bullet or? That's an excellent question. So this is one of the we we did this work in like 2014 and 2015 mostly, and I had I and I think everyone did, but I had a really rough time because I was spending a lot of energy in online harassment groups of so just like how do we stop online harassment. And most of the women that I was working with there thought that it was a gender problem, like it was a gender-based problem, it was violence against women. Um, and it's, it's not, they're social patterns. Um, we run into the same sorts of attacks against religions, against races, et cetera, in other countries and in other cultures. I don't think there's a silver bullet. Uh, I think that there are going to be patterns that we find as we, as we go through this space, I would love to do a large scale analysis of like, what are the different parameters of interaction across different social platforms? What, like, how happy are their communities? And are they reaching representation if representation is something that they care about? Um, and basically offering a, a scientifically backed toolkit to people to make choices. Thank you, so I, I could imagine that uh, what is universal is awareness, right? Uh, awareness of challenges that are out there, but um, if you're talking about a framework, are we not already in advance um, setting some boundaries that other people in other cultures might misinterpret or be offended by? And yeah, how, how, how could we address this sort of bootstrapping problem? Um, because People in other countries have been involved in the process of this project. I'm a little bit less concerned about that. And this is also not uh, authoritarian at all. It's like, hey, we're taking this approach and you might find some use in it. Um, but I, I have no desire to tell people how to interact or what to say or what, like how to design their platforms. It's if you also share the goal of equality, 
maybe you should be taking del like deliberate steps towards reaching that. Um, and here are some potential ways to get there. Thanks. Uh, so for the audience, Mer I think I heard you as uh, Meredith's goal has always been exploratory. Um, that list of uh, knobs that you can twiddle in these online discussions, is it public anywhere? Yeah, it's on the, it's on the wiki. Uh, which wiki? The classic phrase. Um, <laughs> it's at weaponizedsocial.aspirationtech.org. I'll, I'll post a link to it um, on both Mastodon and Twitter, mm -hmm. or you can email me. Um, and we'll probably be migrating it to its own home soon, but we'll leave up redirects, etc. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, can you lean into the mic? Hi. Can you comment whether uh, moderation and evaluation of comments type functions have any impact on the quality and equality of the conversation? Yeah. So Nate Matias uh, is actually the the person who is the expert in that. He looks at community based moderation, so not having an outside party be your moderator, but someone within your group, um, and his research points to it absolutely having an impact on it, but it has various impacts depending on how you're approaching it. Um, he just published his dissertation and it's under open access, so it's, it, it's worth checking out. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that and always enjoy your presentation slides and the way you go about doing that. Um, just, uh, I was a little sad to see and to hear that there's nothing really to do on the response side. And I guess um, uh, there's so many different ways to, to go there, but from maybe just because we're here, from a technological or sort of an architectural, you know, pie in the sky, are there, are there things that you would sort of say are either traits or principles or even maybe specific examples such as like Mastodon or other platforms that already do exist where you think a response is possible or is that just not ever gonna happen? I think that it, it must happen, so we'll figure it out. Um, the only thing that has really come to mind so far is very pragmatic, which is a form of insurance. Um, and so, like, what does it look like to have more resources at your disposal if something does happen to you? Um, there's, a, it's one of the reasons why I am one of the few people who actually saw some value in the right to forget thing. And I know that it's abused in all sorts of ways and it's terribly executed and, like, I'm not saying that it's good as it is right now, but we don't have a mechanism for group forgiveness right now. And it used to be that if you were which happened rarely, ostracized from a small town, you could move to a different small town. And now it's the internet. Um, and there is no other place to move to. Um, and so our, our patterns of um, mass shaming um, are not sustainable. And I am worried about how that's gonna play out in the long run. Yeah. Mike and then Meredith, please. I was wondering, I mean, what are the representation of suppressed groups? Have you thought about engaging them? Because some of, let's say, even the open discussion in, in some cultures could be limiting. Yeah. It's uh, because it's not part of the culture or, or there's actually repression. Yeah, absolutely. But those are the same sorts of of patterns of what we're reliving on the internet now. Right. Um, and so uh, having, as I do my other work in uh, helping affected populations, populations affected by a disaster or a humanitarian crisis, um, organize themselves and decide whether or not to interact with state actors or other agencies or international aid of some kind. Um, this framework has provided useful, um, but there are definitely different assumptions about privacy and of scope and of other things that are in that, that long list. Mm -hmm. And so having a baseline understanding of, of those tools and how it might impact a group or ha having them design their own tools, um, I think would be key. <coughs> so I, code, I, and code design. I'm thinking about the risk of uh, this project talking about these people rather than 
them with them. Right? No, but but I have talked with them. How do, you, how do you how do you, for instance, uh, address people who are uh, women who are oppressed uh, through sexual violence, which is part of the culture, to open up and to be part of the discussion? Uh, so, for instance, we use the same list of parameters when setting up a, even though we hadn't listed them out yet, but mm -hmm. reflecting back for a call center for victims of gender-based violence in, uh, in Port-au-Prince. Um, the same sorts of things apply to like who should be able to look at this information, who is providing it, are they making connections to each other, like all those parameters of interaction. Um, and it's similar to uh, helping design the SMS platform for women in Afghanistan to self-organize to tell stories. Like it's, it's still the same sorts of things, but you have to work with the people who are going to use the tool, just like always. Okay. Thanks. Meredith. Going back to the topic of recovery for a second, one of the things that I used to fight with Casper Bowden about all the time was the right to be forgotten. Um, yeah, I, I, he, he was in favor of it, I was against it, um, until Andrea pointed out to me that it's basically digital exit. You know, you were talking about how, um, you know, online you can basically never hide from your reputation again, but that's one, of the, that's one of the things that the right to be forgotten, I think, is intended to, uh, to try to reestablish. Although, you know, the, 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 the teeth it actually has seem to be, you know, pretty limited. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Like, and to, to get to the earlier question about, is there a silver bullet? There, there isn't. We need to be um, approaching this from multiple vectors at the same time. And so we should all be more forgiving and we should all not escalate quite so quickly. But when there is a persistent problem, maybe we should try to get that person help. And like, what does justice look like? And what does restorative justice look like, et cetera. But at the same time, until we have all of that sorted out. We also need to be thinking about how do we um, help people who have gone through hell, whether they des deserved it or not, like they're still a human being and they need to be able to make a, a living after this sort of thing has happened to them. Right, and you know, they still need to be recognized as a human being. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, somebody else take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I've been crunching a bit further on what my takeaways would be, and I, I was wondering, um, perhaps if Mark Zuckerberg were here and you were to give him one advice which he promised to follow up on, what, what would that be? <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't know that it would be design a design <laughs> in Facebook. What? To change the design in Facebook. Um, I think it would be to give more autonomy to the users uh, in what choices they make and the associated transparency to the algorithms necessary to make those choices. So being, having access to all of these toggles, but also being able to see the effects of changing those toggles on the algorithms, but being able to see it for yourself. Off, off the cuff, that's what I would ask. So more autonomy to individual users? Yeah, so there was uh, the, the Facebook algorithm talk this morning that was fascinating. Um, one of the questions was, if Facebook is running algorithmic analysis of images for nudity, why can't they do it for snakes, for someone who has a snake phobia, right? And so like, I, I do believe that we should be able to create our own experiences, but one of the, one of the things that's over here, I'm not sure where on the list it is, that did not do what I wanted to do. Um, one of these over here is um, seven, randomization slash serendipity slash enforced bubble popping. And this is something that is, uh, so the word homophily is birds of a feather flock together. Like they, that's what it means. And people really like being with people that are like them. Like we're at a conference right now because it's so much easier to be around people that we don't have to explain everything to, right? And like that's why we really enjoy the queer feminist meetups, right? And like it's just like, oh, okay, this is much better. But at the same time, that's not stimulating, right? It's, it, it turns into a sort of, it, uh, it, it's, it's, breeds creativity in one way while also inhibiting it in other ways. Um, and serendipity online is 
really fucking hard. Um, and so that's why it's in this list is because people should at least be making a conscious choice that they are hiding from people or that they are not wanting to interact with those unlike them because maybe their, maybe their focus isn't equal representation and equal voice, et cetera. And then I don't share values with them and I'm not going to help them, but they're a human being and they should be able to do that. I think I would agree with that. And ne next step, would you go as far as saying they should be legally obliged? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Uh, one, because Facebook is a platform, they're not a government. Um, so, well, uh, are they legally obliged to pop bubbles or are they legally obliged to do what? No pop bubbles or, or implement in the architecture measures that uh, force people or let people see outside their bubble. I, I don't think that that falls under the rule of law in any way, shape or form. No, it, 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 do, it doesn't, I guess, but do you think it, it ought to be? Because if, if we're saying that this is a priority, um, the question is how should we implement it? But we, as the builders of platforms, can do this. Um, I, I, yeah. Do we have? I, I don't want to just get into us. Like this is fascinating, and we can keep doing more later. But yeah, I think you can um, have an offline chat with her. Uh, do you have? Do we have any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, let's do a hypothetical example, so maybe that gives you the opportunity or not to illustrate um, how you would do things and how you would do things differently. There was just a Google engineer who threw a uh, curveball uh, to uh, into the uh, general consensus of how things work. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just seeing the shitstorm unfolding. How would things under your proposed infrastructure go, go, and how would they go different from how they're going right now? So one thing would be that as so Google would have needed to be transparent about their current gender ratios and hiring, et cetera, um, and also uh, what sorts of pay scales people are on um, to show whether or not they, like, even if you don't start off in a really equitable place, you can show that you're moving there. Um, and so that is one thing that would have happened. And then the point that this person is making would either be moot or not. Um, because, uh, it would be obvious uh, if Google was working towards equality or if they were not. Um, and the other aspect of it would be that, has the person's name come out? Okay, so right now he's probably getting shamed and, and uh, pedestooled by all sorts of people, right? Um, and so if Twitter had changed some of the way that information propagates on it. Um, this would have been a much more calm thing and maybe the name would not have spread quite so much. Um, and this then gets into like, how do we spread really bad information that needs to get out really fast, right? Like, and I, I don't know how to balance these things. Um, but maybe he, like, and after all of this blows over, the shitstorm blows over, he would have a way to be like, hey, everyone, ends up I was super wrong. I finally read all the research or even a small amount of the research and how different people's brains works or don't work and ends up I was wrong. And the crowd would go, oh, cool. We're glad you learned a, a valuable lesson. And then it would be done and he would still be employable. Um, okay, you're, impli you're implying two things here. Uh, that's his, okay. That he's unemployable afterwards, and for, second, it's, uh, it's a, apparently a foregone conclusion to you that um, he is completely wrong, um, and the, the counter, counter question to that would be um, the first and the last sentences that he, that, that guy wrote um, is basically, um, he's not sure if he's right, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he wants to basically pop, pop a bubble, and he wants to question a few articles of faith. 
Okay. And that uh, that part of the message uh, got kind of de-emphasized, and the uh, the, the methods message that's contrary to the uh, common way things are seen is uh, very overemphasized, and everybody everybody goes down on that. And for example, things like the Norwegian model, where everybody in the country has a uh, has their salary information uh, online, that is that's completely not discussed. Okay. I, I don't understand what uh, it's fine. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay. Cool. Thank you, Willow. Thanks. Um, can we?